And then this evening we'll have a little bit of uh, time and the goal will be to make a live chat program that will talk over the Wi-Fi with no server in any language. And the first person to successfully talk to my computer will win this book. So I will explain the, the chat program in abstract. Uh, it's, I'm going to write in C, but this will work in any language. I did this talk uh, last week in London. The first guy, the one guy who won the book, was working in C sharp. So this works in anything. Um, what this program was going to do, and what it will do, is demonstrate how to discover services on a network. So as Lawrence explained what ZeroMQ does, the problems it solves are about connecting pieces very cheaply. And we've heard a lot about web scale connectivity, but there's a lot of th stuff that happens just locally. A lot of devices in this room right now, I think there's like 40 devices on the network, I counted. A lot of phones, laptops, Wi-Fi cameras, certainly mobile tablets and so on. And one of the interesting use cases for ZeroMQ, one of the ones that interests me personally, is how to connect people in spaces. And this is what this chat program does. So I will explain briefly the, the, the problem of connectivity and, and how we solve it. The first thing is, what's a service on a network? And a service used to be a, a port number on a, you know, an IP address. That's how BSD defines a service. 80 is a service, and 443 is, is a service. But it's gotten more uh, large scale than that. Today we have to be able to discover services which are behind possibly other services behind ports on networks. So there's a bunch of solutions to figuring out what's available and how we can talk to it. We go to an endpoint, we go to some address, some port, and connect with some protocol. And then we say, you know, do you have this service? Can I talk to you? Is there a protocol? The scale has gotten bigger and bigger. And every year, the number of pieces grows by two times. So in one of the chapters in the book, I was going through the different kinds of discovery and how this can work. And what I found are, we can discover by having hard-coded IP addresses in our source code. We can say, literally, I'm going to connect this address. address. Or we can connect to domain names. I'll connect to google.com, facebook.com in my, in my code. I can use configuration files. I can shuffle configuration files around my network, which tell my, my processes where to connect to. Or I can use a service like DNS, which will tell me where other services are. I can create brokers in the middle, which will serve either as full message brokers, where the single, a single service does everything, or as addressing service. And a protocol like uh, voice over IP protocol will have a, a box in the middle somewhere where I talk to a SIP protocol, for example, SIP server. I connect to, and I say, where is this phone number? And it gives me some IP address and port for some mobile phone somewhere in Yugoslavia or something. So there's a indirect through a service uh, addressing service, and so on. Now, what this chat program did was even, even more extreme. It just looks on the local network and tries to connect to everyone that's there. And it's actually very similar to what we do in this room. We're just shouting out and say, who can hear me? Hands up, anyone who can hear me? And I get a few people paying attention. And, and that's how it works. And it's a really, really stupid. It literally says, take the IP address 192.168.69 and then from 1 to 255 and try to connect and see what happens. And there's two lines of code, well, three in C. And it's ridiculously simple. And actually, it works because, as Lauren said in ZeroMQ, the connect is basically asynchronous. It's opportunistic. The connect is not happening in real time, but yeah. synchronously. It's happening in the background opportunistically. So you can set up this little network. As devices come and go, it will connect, disconnect, connect, disconnect. So I can start my laptop if this poor little animal worked. Uh, it's Linux. I had to recompile the kernel to get the screen sharing working. Tragic. And it can run its chat program. And as you come into the room and you come on the Wi-Fi and you get an IP address and you run your copy, they will connect. And as they go away, disconnect. And think about this for a second, it's really lovely. You're getting c things talking to each other without the requirement to be there at the right time or have agreements up front. The agreements do come down in the end to what you're sending on the wire. And one of my favorite hobbies is making protocols that defines these kind of contracts. 
of course, any realistic mobile network doesn't just have one segment. It has uh, various configurations. And, and what we end up doing in real life is not just doing this brute force connect. We end up using UDP as a, as a UDP broadcast or multicast as a very nice way to discover what's going on. I think in, in, inside the network, inside the LAN, but also in public Wi-Fi networks. And we find only a few cases, mostly in America, where public Wi-Fi in McDonald's will not work, or Starbucks. AT&T do not like people using their computers for anything except surfing on, on the official websites. So they block all these uh, interconnections. But most Wi-Fi boxes and most independent Wi-Fi hotspots do this properly. And so thinking as developers in a world where the number of devices doubles every two months, instead of thinking always about my device talks to something on the internet that talks to other devices, think about groups of devices locally, which will end up being very large groups. I believe that we will end up all owning bagfuls of devices, you know, literally 10, 20, 50, 100 little things stuck on our, on our body, inside our body, under our skin, in our glasses, whatever, all on Wi-Fi, all looking for other devices to talk to, very, very opportunistic. Most of the communication is happening very close by, very proximity-based, and then bridging across the internet. And that's the architecture of the future. It's not just my box talking to a server somewhere. The Wi-Fi doesn't handle it on this boat. The bandwidth in the boat is far greater than the bandwidth outside, right? And so discovery, sorry. And so discovery comes down to these two things, local discovery. And the, the one example was brute force connect, the other is UDP, multicast or broadcast. And then remote discovery. And I think for remote discovery, the simplest that works is just having servers, well-known points on the internet that, that help and that mediate this process. And once you can go through a server, you can then talk directly. Once you know that someone's IP address is there, you can often just talk to them. Not always. Sometimes networks don't allow that. Um, and that's kind of the, our vision for very large-scale applications over the next you know, 10, 20 years. I think it'll probably have multiple levels eventually. Um, the number of devices will keep growing pretty much for the next I don't know, 50 years, 100 years, doubling all the time. So that was the 50 line, actually 40 lines in C chat program, which we'll try later on today when I can uh, just small group upstairs. Can I ask anyone here, who's here actually got ZeroMQ on their laptop and running and was ready for this? OK, so we'll have a small group upstairs. Um, since we skipped the code, we have time for a few questions before lunch. And you're all awake now. Lunch will be in, very good in Lyon. The food is excellent. So uh, is anyone who's used ZeroMQ at all? And who's thinking of using it? OK, and who's refusing to use it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a question. First question. Talking about local device discovery. Right. But for companies like, for example, backend or servers, if you go on EC2, it seems to be something I'm done. If I try and discover my other servers, and I host No, no, definitely they won't shut you down. Um, I haven't used EC2 for a while, so I'm not familiar anymore with the networks actually will allow you. But there are a bunch of ways to discover. Okay, if, you're, if, you're, if you know your network layout, which you probably will know, you'll know your network segments, you can just use UDP broadcasts on the network segments. You could just even use the brute force discovery. It depends how many servers you have. If you have a handful, then you may just use literally hard-coded discovery. Here's my, my addresses or some configuration files. If you end up having a few hundred servers, maybe a central server that acts as a mediator. So I like this flexibility of having things in the middle when I have certain problems and distribution when I have other problems. There's no one answer. And in some cases, putting a point in the middle simplifies things a lot. And that simplification is worth it. But you don't want to put traffic through that central point because it makes things slow. So if you have to manage 1,000 EC2 servers, probably the simplest and most reliable is to put a special service in the middle that does addressing and acts as a registration service. And when a server comes up or a service comes up, 
It registers and says, I'm on this endpoint. Here's my IP address. Here's my port. Here's the service I provide. And another application looking for the service says, give me, you know, give me an available service for this, an endpoint for the service, sends a message and gets it back. And they all just agree on one fixed point that they talk to. And then they can talk directly to each other. And you get the advantage of flexibility with simplicity. So there's, there's no one answer. The, really, the trick in architecture is to look for simple, simple results at scale, which is difficult, but that's where the profit is. I think end users, sorry? So the question was whether we're moving away from apps towards services. And I think it's a, it's a good question. I think end users want apps. I mean, end users want to see visual candy. They want eye, you know, eye candy. But it's how much it costs to make those and how well they talk together, how well they scale, how long they last. It's expensive to make apps that you throw away. So services are reusable. And if they're well designed, they can be reusable for a long time. If they're badly designed, they're one off and they throw them away and it's just a waste of time again. So the trick is to have reusable services which talk together over some kind of long-term abstraction protocols, basically. And it's got to be more than just uh, here's some XML over HTTP. That's not enough. It doesn't scale. It's not asynchronous. A very a, a high quality service is completely asynchronous. It's completely message driven. You throw it stuff. It churns through that as fast as it can and it produces results somewhere. And that's a black box that can be reused in any environment. Um, it's very hard to do, but when you succeed, you, could, you get things that can be reused for a long time. So I think there's a value. But in, in the architecture, you, you, you switch between long-term constructions and short-term constructions. You, you know, some things are made to be thrown away, and some things are made to be kept. So there's no one answer there again. Okay, so, right. So concrete examples for ZeroMQ. There are a few really classic use cases. and They are certain kinds of big data, big problems. I'm talking about scale here. So big data would be I have to distribute this stre these streams of millions of messages per second to literally thousands or millions of clients that want to consume them, the stock market style scenario, right, Chicago. Chicago is a, a popular spot for ZeroMQ. That's where it started. How do you, how do you distribute you know, 8 million messages a second to, to 100,000 clients? It's a very difficult problem. And the answer is you have very careful PubSub networks that do that. That's a, where PubSub comes from. Using PGM if they're local, using whatever if you can. Um, classic, straightforward, cheap, effective, stable. A well-known problem, very good solution. Okay. Another more difficult problem is big data when it comes to processing. How do I do image rendering? I have to render these one million frames. Each frame takes 30 seconds of CPU time, of GPU time somewhere. I have this render farm. How do I distribute the work on that and get the results back? And that's where you'd have like a push-pull pattern. And so these patterns in ZeroMQ are really like prepackaged solutions for the well-known problems, the classic problems. So you push out your, your, your work, you have a frame description is quite small. The results are very large. So you, you have this, 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 this movie with your, your million frames. Each is quite a small frame. And they get distributed to your 5,000 workers. They churn through them, and it all comes back. It's written to disk, high resolution render, the other side. And so render farms and ZeroMQ go together very, very well. And it's been used in, in large movies, large use cases for that. Any kind of work that can be broken up and distributed but these are fairly basic patterns, even, in the sense that they're classic, they're well understood, and the answers are well understood. So you can solve them with ZeroMQ in a very short time, like literally almost out of the box. And what's more fun is trying to attack patterns that we haven't really understood very well yet, and where there's a lot of learning to do as you, as you go through them. Very large-scale service orientation, so I have lots of 
services competing for, for clients? How do they talk to each other? How do they agree where the clients are? You know, buy and sell their time, that kind of thing. Or mobile, like I said, mobile connectivity. How do I connect 50 mobile tablets in the school? Difficult to do. Sounds easy, it's not. Things come and go a lot. So what I like about Xerium Q as a programmer is that mix I have of very, very solid answers to the classic problems and very cheap experimentation for new kinds of, of connectivity. It's cross-language, cross-platform. So any language can talk to any language. Xerium Q has a very minimal framing that it imposes. And apart from that, what you carry are opaque blobs. So as long as I agree on those, I can talk to any, any, any language. Um, and so the focus as an architect comes down to really protocol design rather than application design, which is nice long term. Last question before lunch. What's the, uh, the most interesting? I think, right, I think it'd be something like the, the, the IPython. The, um, basically, you have this, 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 this mass. This is one of, the, one of the first real products made with CRMQ, uh, made by a, a group in, in San Francisco. And they use this computing framework where you, you use Python to calculate stuff, and it sends off to this concurrent backend. Um, it works amazingly well and it brings it brings this this front end to a whole group of users that was you know couldn't use it before um, and it's all using the zero queue for the concurrent um, for the concurrency the back end they had some difficulties because at that time there was no security in zero queue I mean there's no way to do it they build their own security model that's one of the big lacks in zero queue which we're, we're solving we'll have some answers to that in the in the next months um, but I think what really the really interesting use cases for me were little open source projects. So a lot of little teams that simply couldn't afford to make distributed architectures before. It was very expensive. It's been very complex before. Just the concepts are hard to understand. And most of the solutions are big and complex and take time to understand. And that kind of excludes little teams. And it's fun to see the meetups and the most active meetups are in a city like Portland which is very much little open source teams and they're doing stuff with it which is just very strange you know mongrel 2 is a very good example very strange little web server built around Xerium queue so stuff that I can't even imagine and since it's open source we don't really see we only see people with with problems who are mostly the not so smart people to be honest who come with questions like how do I do this more like oh read the book by the way the book so thanks to the organizers for this amazing, amazing vote. I think we're finished, right, for lunch now? Okay, thank you.